this session is about Kubernetes and confidential computing. So hope everybody's in the right room. My name is uh, Moritz Eckert. I'm yeah having a background in the software system security space, done a lot of like binary, binary analysis, reverse engineering. Spent a fair bit of amount of time in the capture the flag uh, competition scene, and yeah, on my day job I work as a you know, architect at Edgeless Systems, which is a startup from Bochum, Germany, and we build open source software for confidential computing. Uh, on the right hand side here, you can see at least uh, some of the team in our office. I'm also a member of the. Uh, organization team for the Open Confidential Computing Conference, which is a free online conference focusing just on uh, confidential computing that happens uh, yeah, online every year in spring since three years now. And I also attend a lot of conferences giving talks just to spread the message a bit, do a bit of educational work for, for this fairly new topic of confidential computing, which also, yeah, which brings me to, to this talk. Um, what I like to talk about today is first giving an introduction. I know there have been two other talks on confidential computing here, so if you've seen them and you saw the introduction or you attended a talk at some other conference, you might be familiar with that. I'm sorry to bother, but yeah, it's still a fairly new topic and I don't want to lose anybody, so I will give a short introduction, the, the fundamentals, and then we focus on, first of all, why. I mean, this is a security technology, so the, the threat model and the, the use cases are kind of important. And then we will see how we can yeah, actually use that a more practical approach and, and see how this fits into our cloud native, yeah, Kubernetes based world in the cloud. All right. So if you've heard anything about confidential computing, you probably have seen that graphic, right? Where the states of data and how we protect it. You all are probably familiar with the fact that you can encrypt your, your files, your disk, whatever is your data at rest. Uh, that's pretty much straightforward and we can, if we send data over the network or some other channel, we also have transport encryption for that. Yeah, that's, that's nothing new. What confidential computing brings into play is now that we want to protect the data also while it's in use and pretty much filling the gap. So then we can have encryption or protection in all states of the data, making it possible to for the first time to have like real end-to-end -end encryption or protection of that data and there's not only confidential computing that aims for that goal there are other solutions like homomorphic encryption um, and some other privacy enhancing technologies maybe so the way confidential computing approaches this is via a hardware uh, yeah hardware feature new hardware technology that creates usually called trusted execution environments that means a um, space, a context uh, from your processor that allows to isolate your code uh, data from the rest of the system, from the rest of the hardware. And that uh, adds the nice property that the, the data is actually encrypted while it's in the main memory and that you have a form of remote attestation. I mean, remote attestation is probably a, a term that pops up in other areas as well. With confidential computing, the goal is that you can attest, cryptographically prove the integrity, identity, and confidentiality of your trusted execution environment from a remote location and basically have the root of trust only in your, in your hardware, in your processor, or in your CPU. What that means um, depends on the implementation of this trust execution environment we'll take a look at now. Probably the first iteration, and most have heard of it by now in a good or in a bad way, is, is Intel SGX that isolates an individual process. So your trusted execution environment is a process that's isolated from the rest of the system where your code and data resides. And the advantage is that a process can be very small. You can have very little amount of pages inside that process that are inside this confidential context. The disadvantage of Intel SGX is that since your guest OS or your, your system um, is not part of that context, anytime you have a context switch, you also have now a context switch from that secure trust execution environment to the untrusted world. 
which can have some significant impact on your performance and also means that you don't have a regular system interface. So you can just lift and shift any kind of application into an SGX um, TE or Enclave, whatever you want to call it. Instead, you either need to adapt your application or you need some compatibility layer like a library S. Think of like a Vine emulation in, in, in Linux, if you're familiar with that concept. Uh, in a similar way, you need to do that here. So small uh, context, but um, no real lift and shift. And the next generation, if you want to call it like that, is now that the, the latest hardware generation, uh, instead of isolating a process, we cut off at, above the hypervisor and isolate a, an entire VM. That means the guest OS of that VM is also part of that context. So we increase this confidential context. But the advantage is now that we have a more um, a better interface for running applications inside, right? They don't, uh, they have a full system interface, they have a kernel and a, no, 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 guest OS inside. So here we can have a better lift and shift approach. And AMD SEV was probably the first uh, uh, implementation of that that now has, uh, or is available in the third generation called SEV SP. Intel has a, yeah, in addition to, to SGX called Intel TDX that follows the same pattern. A, uh, ARM has a specification called ARM Confidential Computing Architecture. There's a reference specification for RISC V. Uh, IBM Secure Execution is the same same thing essentially. So this is where we are heading, right? Uh, where we are already right? confidential VMs isolating an entire VM. Um, yeah. So far, this exclusively focused on CPUs. We see a bit of a trend that, that especially with this uh, AI hype, that we're not only dealing with CPUs anymore. But what about GPUs? And it's just, a, it's just a processor, right? So we can have the same properties. We can have isolation of workloads running on that GPU. We ha can have, have the memory encrypted. We can also test GPUs, uh, technically. Yeah. And NVIDIA has now released the, with the H100 the first implementation of pretty much the same principle for trust execution environment on your GPU. And essentially, the way it's now attached to that context um, yeah, is that you have a confidential VM. Uh, there's a driver. It does the um, communication with that GPU, does the attestation, and connects that to your, uh, to your context. And in the future, this other PCI Express devices will follow a similar pattern. So you can have network accelerators and so forth uh, working more or less in the same way. Any questions regarding those hardware principles, building blocks? All right. So the question is, why would we, why would we uh, do all these gymnastics to create those trust execution environments, deal with these hardware extensions? What are the use cases? And um, yeah, what is the threat model for these use cases? And the first one is, is definitely infrastructure security. Right? There's this notion of the cloud just being somebody else's computer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the idea remains the same. If we move to um, move out of our own uh, hardware, or do we even trust our own hardware and move into a space where there's uh, shared resources, where there's a, a third party, a service provider uh, having direct access to that, or some edge location that's potentially hostile? How can we protect against the, the infrastructure? I will go into detail of that use case in a second. The other use case um, is more of like new types of things you can implement with that technology and multi-party uh, scenarios. Their confidential computing is not the only solution making this uh, possible, but it's one probably one the, the most performant one right now. Um, there was a talk. There was the mini uh, confidential computing mini summit on on Monday, uh, and uh, Sven Trieflinger gave a, a very interesting presentation on how we can combine different privacy-enhancing technologies to build, uh, to, to, yeah, to um, implement such multi-party scenarios, and confidential computing can, can play our, an, an integral part into that. Yes, um, with all I said, the, the GPUs, with all of this hype about AI, large language models, um, they also embarks a discussion on now that there's somebody owning that model, providing that service, uh, and we're feeding that data either through 
via training or also via inference. Uh, what if this data contains personable identifiable information? Uh, or if this is the, the data could potentially contain some intellectual property from a company, um, do we need to shut down? Should we block ChatGPT, for example? So there's a lot of interesting use cases that embark from that. Can we provide any type of AI uh, solution in a privacy-preserving manner, or can we bring models to where the data is and protect the model so the, the owner, if, if there's the owner of the model, right, uh, doesn't need to fear about losing their IP. And finally, supply chain security. Um, confidential computing, of course, can be like the last link in the chain where you also protect the environment your, your solution is then running in. So all of the links before don't end up in an untrusted environment. But it can also be applied to the actual supply chain itself. Um, Mike Brazel gave a really cool talk on that on Tuesday at uh, Supply Chain Con on how you can apply confidential computing to those stages and, and really uh, establish trust for the environments where you package, where you build, or where you sign your, your software. So infrastructure-based threats. Um, as I said, confidential computing is not a solution that will solve all your problems. It's really important to get the idea that we're not talking about attack through the front door, a vulnerability in your application, yeah, a CVE in your container, um, you expose that via the internet and somebody exploits it. Confidential computing won't help you there. But we're talking about threats where there's more than indirect access. Uh, another tenant in the cloud gaining access to the cloud infrastructure and going vertically, horizontally through that infrastructure and, and into your application or your data. Or somebody that has legitimate access, like a foreign government, that demands access to that, um, or just some employee that might get compromised, and somebody's attacking you via that vector. And of course, right now, this is highly, um, yeah, this is mostly the concern of, of very regulated or paranoid industries. They either fear their, their IP or they're dealing with very sensitive information, and they simply can't modernize their IT, they can't adopt the cloud. Right, because they are simply not allowed to, uh, either because uh, legal says no or their, their fear about compliance. So their confidential computing can be a very promising solution where you can say I can isolate myself from the infrastructure because of the properties of runtime encryption, isolation, and then attestation. I can also verify, cryptographically verify that what's running there has indeed, uh, is indeed isolated. I said, very, uh, I said the, the, currently the focus is mo mostly on highly regulated or um, paranoid industries. But Mark Rosinovich, the, the Azure CTO at, at OC3, gave a keynote where he said, uh, we're heading towards a fully confidential cloud. Whatever fully confidential cloud means, uh, I think the, the general idea is often referred to the Let's Encrypt movement, where initially, before Let's Encrypt, getting a certificate for your website was very tedious, and there was not a lot of HTTPS traffic, um, simply because it was not, was, was, was hard to, to get there. Um, with Let's Encrypt and the rise of, or the ease of making this, this use of, of TLS, allows allowed to really um, yeah, make this the norm. And today it's hard to, to browse the web without using TLS encryption. It's hard. Most browsers won't even let you, let you uh, easily surf to a website. And I'm not saying that that's the same, right? That transport encryption is the same as uh, runtime memory encryption or, or confidential computing. But there's definitely something to be learned from, from, from there, some, some lessons. And the first one is, I think, definitely my focus is we need to make this very easy to use. We need uh, approachable, usable, make it almost invisible so that you don't have to deal with the, all of the details, um, but instead can just adopt this, this pattern. And then we come more to the, to the step where we say, like, like with TLS, right, initially I would just have my bank, uh, my online banking have used HTTPS, and, and you were saying, why would I use that for my personal blog? There's nothing secret about it. Um, and similarly here, we could say, in, there might be a future where you say, why would you not use the trust execution environment, the confidential computing, um, because it's just, it's just there and it's encrypted. Yeah, and of course, we need to make it abstract. We need to make it neutral, vendor neutral. Confidential computing is 
very vendor specific technology so far. And yeah, it finally co co yeah, commoditized conventional computing in a sense. And we're here at Open Source Summit. So the question is, why is open source so essentially essential also for confidential computing? I mean, for the obvious reasons. Uh, don't need to tell you that. But with confidential computing, with this notion of remote attestation, the fact that whatever you are testing needs to be somehow verifiable, semantically verifiable, means that the software that's verified there, you need to have access to that source code. Otherwise, you're verifying a black box, and you say, well, you can say, well, this is the black box I might have seen before, but you don't know what it's doing. So there's not, not much gained. Um, so yeah, attestation requires, in my opinion, requires open source. Right. Any questions regarding the, the threat model or the, the use cases? Okay. So let's see the how. <laughs> I guess that's the interesting part of, of this presentation. Um, I probably don't need to, to explain you that, but just uh, for the slide here, um, yeah, if we consider a Kubernetes cluster or a typical cloud environment where right, we have a Kubernetes node, that's usually a VM, at least if we talk about the cloud, um, a, or workload package inside a container that runs in, in uh, or that is handled as an entity called pod, and they are scheduled and reside in those nodes. And then the node has some agent called the kubelet to talk to the Kubernetes uh, control plane, which itself are just a specific type of a node that runs the, um, yeah, the orchestrational uh, services of, of uh, Kubernetes. And we can have multiple of these VMs. So another question is, I have my containerized application. How may, do I make use of confidential computing, how can I deploy my application as a trusted execution environment, potentially in the cloud? And the first approach uh, would be how we do that with SGX. Um, SGX, as I said, is just a process-based solution. So you can package your container uh, by basically making the process that's running inside there an SGX enclave. And that's more or less it. The question is, how do we do that? Um, as I said, it's not straightforward. You can just lift and shift the application. It's a bit more tedious. So there are different projects that try to aim to make this more easy. But I would still say that this highly, or this mainly applies to where you write new types of application and not really lift and shifting existing applications. So there are def technically two approaches taken. One is having a language specific runtime like Ego for Go or Enox for WebAssembly, or as I said, this library as based pattern where you have a compatibility layer like Occlum or Grameen have. And that they try to make it a lift and shift of kind of like experience to move your, uh, your containerized workload into, into an SGX enclave. So what you do is basically repackage your application with one of those tools, uh, create a container, and then you need to make SGX available to those containers. And SGX appears for your node, appears more or less just a device or is a device. So you, there's an Intel, S, Intel device driver that you install in your cluster, and that first of all exposes the, the SGX device to your uh, containers, and then it adds some um, form for, for making this uh, um, schedulable. So uh, essentially, uh, you add some annotations to your deployment files uh, where you say, for example, here I need that, uh, that amount of um, me memory for my, for my enclave. And then the scheduler knows, first of all, that this needs to be moved to a node where SGX is available. And um, yeah, how much uh, resources this consumes from an SGX point of view. Uh, this, is, this is for Gram or Grameen. And then you can have multiple containers for all running SGX if you have the, the nodes available um, with SGX capabilities. And then this, this is pretty much uh, we, we, where we were uh, yeah, a couple of years back, um, facing the problem now that we have all of these SGX enclaves running in our cluster. Uh, how do we orchestrate them? Right? How would we provide a config map to that SGX container? And can still be and can trust that the data that what we con uh, specified in the in the config map ends up in the container, or how do we provide it with a file, right? Um, how do we attest all of these enclaves, 
uh, all of these SGX uh, containers, right? We need to verify that this is really, really an SGX enclave running there, and it's really the enclave we expect it to be running there, because we, we can't trust the Kubernetes control plane. It's in the untrusted world. Uh, we can trust the kubelet. Um, how do we do that? How do we allow them to communicate with, with each other so that the container on the left knows that the container on the right is also running inside an SGX enclave, and it's the enclave it expected to be there, and then establish a secure, secure communication. So this orchestration is a, is a challenge. And yeah, we built a, an open source project called Marburon to yeah, tackle these tasks. Um, essentially, the idea is that you create a trusted controller. When I say trusted controller, I mean a controller that itself runs inside an SGX enclave. That is there for, first of all, bootstrapping this deployment, and then for you for orchestrating that during the, the lifetime of this deployment. So essentially, you verify the controller, you provide it with a policy called manifest, and then it takes care of these tasks I've mentioned, yeah, testing the d individual containers, providing them with their um, identity and uh, configuration, and then allows them to, to yeah, build up a microservice um, um, architecture. And there, Marmaran is not the only solution in that space. Uh, there are a lot of proprietary uh, things that do similar things. Um, or the cloud provider like Azure has, has something um, in place. Um, but uh, yeah, Marmaran is probably the, the, I wouldn't say the only, but the, the most prominent open source solution for this. All right. Um, what it would look like? From a deployment kind of perspective, you would create a, a Kubernetes cluster. All your nodes need to have SGX capabilities, and then you um, create a device plugin or install a device plugin. If you want to install Marburon and go through that procedure, and then you apply your application with those added annotations, and then your scheduler would put them on the right node, and uh, things would, would roll out from there. That's how the SGX world would look like. Any questions regarding that? Okay. There's a prominent example for this. Uh, um, the, in Germany, we have the um, e electronic health records that's currently being rolled out, uh, uh, currently opt-in, potentially opt-out uh, end of next year. And the specification for this uh, specifically requires that the operator of that system is ex excluded from the, the, data, in the data itself. Um, and yeah, confidential computing provides a promising solution to, to implement that such system. And in fact, there is a production environment for the, for the EPA um, that is based on SGX. Yeah, it kind of matches here because new types of application, like the new implementation anyway, and small uh, trusted context and an easy ability to exclude yourself or the, the, the DevOps and the, uh, the, the, the um, the administrators from that application. The second approach, and as I said, confidential VMs is more of where the future is, right? Because it's it's just the better abstraction for really um, not caring about the confidential computing specific cards when building and packaging your application. And the, f the next approach would be bringing together confidential VMs, so MDSCV, TDX, and containers. And the general idea that's probably the, the most um, yeah, uh, promising is the idea of um, using VMs to f as a, for every container or every pod in your Kubernetes cluster. So that means um, instead of just creating a container, you create a confidential VM when you, when you create your uh, your pod. And ideally, that would be in a nested way so that you have your node, which is a VM, and then you can have a nested VM for that container. Nested is a tricky thing, and especially nested with confidential VM, uh, with a confidential VM is, is, a, is a very tricky thing. So this currently is not uh, possible. Um, there's a preview on, on Azure that allows you to do that, but otherwise uh, we're not quite there yet. Instead, a pattern emerged where you say, I do um, or use something like a remote hypervisor, 
where instead of creating that VM locally, you create that VM some, just somewhere else in the cloud and yeah, tunnel the, the traffic through. So that means you don't need nested. You have a workaround around that. The downside is, of course, you now deal a bit of, mid, of an overhead, right? You need to create a, a separate VM in the cloud for every uh, pod, and you need to handle the traffic and the interaction. The, the concept is based on Kata containers. Some of you might know that. Um, yeah, creating VMs for pods. The idea is essentially actually for, by, for Kata, the idea is to protect your infrastructure from the from the container, and Turning that concept around is essentially what we, what we have here, and there's a CNCF project called Confidential Containers that implements that. Um, super promising project. Unfortunately, there are a lot of still some, some yeah, roadblocks, some things need to be implemented uh, in terms of making this work. Some prototypes already exist, and the main um, problems that are coming up is the same with SGX. We don't trust the control plane, we don't trust the kubelet, how do we do orchestration? The problems I described, right? providing a config map to such a confidential container. How does it work with attestation? How do you verify that? Um, so similar patterns that uh, with Marmara need to be uh, applied to confidential containers. There was a um, talk specifically on that here on Tuesday uh, from Magnus. Um, so a lot more of the details about this project, where it is um, and how it works. I'm not gonna go more into the details of confidential containers. If you're interested, uh, Please check the, the recording, super cool talk. And the last approach would be probably the, the straightforward one with confidential VMs and how we bring that into a cluster by taking what is already a VM and applying the confidential VMs there. And that means our Kubernetes nodes. So instead of applying it on a container, we apply it to the entire VM, the entire node. And this must also, or this can also include the control plane don't must, but then you have to deal with this, uh, this the, the problem again. But you can also include the control plane and essentially create a confidential context for the entire cluster. And there, um, it shifts a bit, right? Before, you could isolate a container or a process inside that container, which probably is then the same, um, but now you isolate the entire cluster. So it's a different threat model. You don't exclude the operator of that cluster anymore, but you isolate the cluster against the infrastructure. So this is the thing um, that makes sense if you do want to lift and shift and you can't trust the infrastructure, you can't trust the cloud service provider, you want to isolate against that, but you don't want to isolate against your own administrators. So not the e e e electronic health records uh, type of thing, but more this lift and shift thing for uh, regulated industries that want to adopt the cloud or I don't know, deploy a cluster in a hostile environment, and need to isolate themselves against that. And yeah, the, 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 the cool thing about this is we can use that today. We have the confidential VMs. Um, we don't have the problem of nested virtualization. So we have a project called Constellation that implements that pattern that shields a cluster as a whole. And the, the technical trick here or the, the challenge is how you can make an entire VM verifiable, attestable, how do you build up the node OS image, how do you do the attestation procedure um, and continue to do that during the lifetime of that cluster. And if you solve that, uh, then you can have a, an isolated cluster. So the, the workflow, for example, for Constellation would be, yeah, it's more or less than like a Kubernetes distribution that is yeah, um, don't really want to make comparisons here, but essentially, um, yeah, if you want to create a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud um, and don't want to use the managed offering, that's more or less how it feels like. You use the computer resources, the VMs, and then um, you have client-side tooling like that here. Uh, you can, of course, also use infrastructure as code like Terraform or so. But essentially, what needs to be done is creating that infrastructure, creating that conf confidential VMs, uh, testing them, bringing it together as a, as a cluster. And as I said, then it's isolated as a whole. So if you go inside, if you have access to the API server from the inside, then it's just Kubernetes. So you don't need to deal with these orchestrational tasks. You can just use uh, Kubernetes as is. Um, examples for constellation, of course, there are a bunch of them. Um, it's really hard to pinpoint, right? It's uh, 
any kind of application that, that runs in Constellation, uh, sorry, that runs in Kubernetes and you want to shift that to the cloud, because it's a lot of uh, regulated industries, uh, yeah, it's a lot of this more um, healthcare, public sector kind of applications, like a hospital information system or a, a collaborative tool like Nextcloud and so forth. But one very cool use case was uh, OCCRP. Um, it's a, um, an investigative journalism organization that targets uh, organized crime and corruption. And they have very, of course, very paranoid for, several, for, 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 for legitimate reasons and want to be very sure that the data they're collecting, their sources, need to be completely protected and isolated from the infrastructure. And they make use of, of Constellation for, for running their, um, yeah, their um, software in, in the cloud. And um, yeah, there's a, a case study uh, you can find online on that. Uh, yeah, super cool use case. Questions on either SGX, Confidential Containers, or Constellation? All right. Um, takeaways. Um, I think important to understand is that confidential computing is not a solves all your problem solution. It adds these features: runtime encryption, I, um, attestation, and isolation. And this shifts a bit of the trust model in the cloud. Depending on how you implement it, it allows you to exclude a fair amount of chunk of the stack we have in the cloud today so that you can reduce that to trust the hardware. You trust the CPU, of course, or the GPU, and of course you trust the vendor, in a sense. You do that already, right? If you run on a CPU, you trust that it does the computation correctly. Um, but we can reduce the trust to that now, and of course then we trust the software that runs inside the context. And depending on how big the context is, you have to trust more or less components. That's the, 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 the idea. And yeah, we have the three approaches. SGX, uh, it's probably a bit of like the legacy of confidential computing, uh, but as I said, there are still use cases, so I thought it would be interesting to also show that. Um, confidential containers, very promising, very much looking forward to what's coming there. Um, I would say it's not right there yet for production, but uh, there's super cool concepts in the pipeline. And then uh, the more straightforward approach with the downside of having a different model where you don't can exclude yourself, but you exclude just the infrastructure. But there, um, then you get real, like the closest you can get to, to lift and shift. Check out the Confidential Containers talk uh, from Magnus to, to learn more about that. So now the question is how to get going, how to get going, how can I you now bring that to use? Where is it available, right? Just the, 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 the important thing is you need the hardware. You need the AMD SMB chip, the TDX chip or the SGX chip. In your processors, so where can I get it? And I would say most cloud providers have some form of confidential computing offering. First of all, they have the infrastructure as a service, so they have the confidential VMs or the SGX capable machines. Um, I think it's fair to say that only IBM and I think Microsoft have the, the Intel SGX, and all others, uh, or all of them have the, the confidential VMs. This is the, the focus now. Um, AWS has something that's called Nitro Enclaves. I didn't cover that today uh, to not overwhelm you, but uh, AWS now has also SCV uh, capable machines. And you can go there and you can create um, these as infrastructure as, as, uh, as service. And you can, of course, use uh, any kinds of the, the projects, right? Use uh, convergent containers to experiment with a bit of the prototypes or create a constellation cluster today on any of these um, and much more. Uh, just try to put the big ones on here. All right, uh, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I guess we have a bit of time left. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hi. Thanks for the, the talk. Uh, I'll make the same question I made to Magnus on Tuesday, okay? What about monitoring in, in yeah. confidential computing? <laughs> yeah. And, and I probably have to give you the same answer as Magnus. It's, 
Monitoring is a tricky, tricky challenge. Uh, we need it, um, but it somehow contradicts a bit of these uh, confidential computing principle that your thing is isolated. There's no physical law that will prevent to build smart solutions for monitoring these, um, but um, yeah, we need some concepts for that. So what you can do today is, of course, this is from the cloud provider's perspective, this is infrastructure. So there's a VM or there's a confidential VM. You get some kind of observability from there. You can't get the full observability because you can't peek inside. Um, so then you need monitoring from the inside. And for example, for Constellation, you can deploy your usual monitoring stack inside Constellation. It's a Kubernetes cluster, so why wouldn't you? Um, and then you need to make smart decision on who has access to that monitoring, what kind of data is, is visible there, and what are the, the endpoints, right? Where is this consumed? Um, and for confidential containers, uh, it's probably similar uh, with the, um, the additional challenge that you only trust the container itself and you can't trust the rest of the Kubernetes stack. So there's a bit more challenges involved, yeah. Thank you for the talk. So what's the largest challenge do you see for the third approach, the cluster? Uh, so, so the the, the la largest ch challenge for, for the... Third. The largest challenge? Oh, um, the, the, the biggest challenge is that because you exclude the control plane from... Uh, or you, you include the control plane in, the, in, the, in that tr confidential context, your service provider, like your cloud provider, can have access to that. Because if they have access, you break that isolation. Um, that means you can't straightforward, you, you can't really implement this as a managed Kubernetes offering. This, if you go to, I don't know, Azure or Google today, they will offer you a AKS, a GKE with confidential nodes. That doesn't include the control plane. And this gives you runtime encryption for those nodes but it doesn't have any kind of isolation against, or like no real isolation against the cloud provider or the, the infrastructure, because as soon as you get access to the control plane, you get access to the cluster. And the reason why they, they don't include the control plane, because then they would need to exclude yourself, and how can you make it this managed uh, without excluding your, uh, with, while being excluded? And yeah, with Constellation, we try to implement a lot of approaches to make this easy, make this feasible, but in the end, it's, it, this is the challenge. Uh, this is the biggest challenge. Uh, do you guys do any sort of performance testing, for example, like on the on the with the, in the SGX, the process-based con confidential computing? Y yeah, perf perf performance is usually one of the biggest concerns, and therefore that's focused for us. Yeah, um, it's hard to pinpoint and say you get like five percent overhead. Really hard to say. Um, the, if you ask the hardware vendors. And Magnus already said that they will tell you something like 2%. And then the question is, 2% <laughs> of what? Is that realistic? And is the main overhead? So what we observe is the runtime overhead is actually not that high. So between 2 and 10% is also what we observe. But is that the main source of overhead? Is more on the I.O. side probably? Um, with SGX, the context switches. So if you do a lot of I.O., that's the biggest concern. With VMs, we see better performance due to this context switch not being happening too often. Um, and uh, we, yeah, we, on the, on the, in our GitHub repository, you find uh, benchmarks, um, for example, for, for Constellation specifically running applications inside confidential VMs. And yeah, it varies a lot. Um, but usually you, you're in that, I would say around like this 10% mark, right? Um, roughly. For, for an application. But then 10% of what, right? 10% of runtime overhead, uh, or if you, let's say, have, let's say if you have a GitLab or a, I don't know, a, a chat, like a rocket chat, how many users you can serve in parallel, um, and then you have like a 10% reduction if you run it on that. So 10% yeah. so, so for like a AMD SCV SNP? Yes, uh, that's, that's currently on AMD SCV, yeah. Okay. Uh, with SGX, you can generally say, or you can't really generally say one is worse than the other, but I would say SGX, because of these context switches, is more prone to overhead. Oh. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Enjoy.